I, I, I really think there's an opportunity here for the, the built environment to, to be the, you know, to really set the agenda around net zero. It could move so quickly to be, you know, this is one of the areas that hasn't moved. You know, transport's getting its, its, uh, its shift, and energy's starting to bring its uh, emissions down. So it hasn't really done that yet. But it could be the absolute exemplar. We're going beyond that, as I said, to giving a better life to the users of buildings. You've got to be user focused. Um, you know, I'd like to be able to buy or rent you know, a building that has all of those things I just talked about. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future Rights, a podcast by Martin Hearn, Event Director, Future Build, and co host Dr. Oliver Jones, Research Director at Rider Architecture. FutureX will bring together some of the brightest minds and some of the most disruptive thinkers and innovators to transform the construction industry and build a FutureX community of like-minded people that can begin to make a real change. We really hope you enjoy the series. Hello and welcome to FutureX. I'm Martin Hearn, Event Director at FutureBuild, and once again I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Oliver Jones, Research Director at Rider Architecture. This week, we're talking to Dr. Mike Pitts. He is the Deputy Challenge Director for Transforming Construction, which is the government's industrial strategy programme linked to the sector deal and managed by Innovate UK, part of UK Research and Innovation. Oliver, fascinating conversation this week. Oh, I love catching up with, uh, with Mike Martin. You know, he's a he's a he's a founder of knowledge in terms of research and innovation, and the way that the the UK is a, a, a really sort of attacking it and trying to make a name for itself on the global stage. You know, the the, the role that the UKRI and the Transforming Construction Sector Challenge play within uh, innovation in and an R and D in construction and the and the wider built environment sector is absolutely critical. And I think we touch upon that today. You know, if we didn't have those guys who were taking the risk and joining people up from different sectors and funding demonstrators and really pushing the boundaries of, of how we're going to achieve a net zero future and how we might totally radically transform our sector to focus on value and sustainability, then, you know, we'd be a lot further behind than, than we are now. So. For me, it was absolutely great to talk to Mike. You know, he mentioned so many really interesting things around the need to adopt design thinking throughout the process from really early on, um, the need to bring in all those different external um, players and, and sectors. You know, he himself is a, a chemist um, who's, who's having a fundamental role in trying to change the construction sector and doing a great job at it. So it, it, it's really testament to that multidisciplinary collaborative approach of how we can build a better future in the built environment. Yeah, I agree. I think what it showed to me is that we have the technologies, we have the innovation. It's just the main challenge is just getting it and disseminating it to people like yourself, actually. And actually, you know, an interesting question for you is, how do you find innovation and, and what do you find the barriers in your day-to-day work and getting that innovation into the projects you're working on? That's a great question, Martin. I think, I think we're changing. We're seeing a change now. Mm. So... You know, we've we've a uh, rider. We've had a real focus on research innovation uh, for quite some time now. Um, but what we're seeing in the sector is that that's much more commonplace, and it's really encouraging to see that there's a lot more experimentation. There's a lot more um, challenging of the norm of the way that things have been done. And as we'll see over the coming weeks on the Future X podcast with with our range of guests that are that'll be coming down the pipeline. We'll talk a bit about some of those challenges uh, with regards to how do we embed innovation in the construction sector. One of the main ones is that we, you know, we still are incredibly fractured and, and quite siloed in our thinking and ways of working um, as a sector. And a lot of the new startups are just insanely intelligent people who are not from our sector. You know, as I've mentioned numerous times before, they're chemists and marine biologists and microbiologists who just look at our sector and say, "I've got, a, I've got a solution to this." But I just don't understand the way you guys work. I don't understand the layout of the sector. How do I get into it? How do how are buildings put together? And that was really interesting to speak to Mike about those challenges as well. Because as you're right, as we touched on, we've got all of the answers. You know, we we've got all of the pieces of this massive puzzle. We just haven't put them together yet. 
You know, we've had some amazing advances in energy. We've had some amazing advances in, in value and procuring for value and different forms of advanced materials and construction methods and, and the platform system that we talked to Mike a lot about. Um, we just need to bring all that stuff together into one place and we need to start building using all of those different elements. I agree. I thought it was fascinating to hear Mike also say, you know, make the big statement that net zero and net zero homes is very easy to achieve. You know, we have that technology, you know, we just need to, you know, change the way we're thinking, you know, the and it was really fascinating to hear about the ABC project, the Active Building Centre project in North Wales, where it's achievable a cheap you know, cheaper than a standard home. Yeah. I think that's a fundamental shift. Definitely. And, you know, Mike, some of Mike's anecdotal figures of, of reductions in energy bills, are, uh, we've seen that coming on the horizon, mm. you know, we, and that's going, to, that's going to have a really deep impact on the structure of that energy market. And we're going to see exactly the same kind of impact with um, the adoption of platform systems and MMC in the, in, in the construction sector as well over time. You know, this isn't going to happen overnight, but it's definitely a positive thing. It gives us more constraints to work within. It, it enables us to um, deliver some of the more repeatable aspects of buildings much, much quicker and really focus, as Mike so eloquently put it, on the areas that we can add value on projects that really improve people's lives. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's intro our guest. Hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So... I guess really, Mike, just to kick us off and introduce the audience to the journey that you've been on and um, your, your educational route and where you are now, a little bit of background would be really helpful. Sure. So, you know, I think a few people wonder why I'm a Deputy Challenge Director for Transforming Construction when I'm actually uh, a trained chemist. So I have a PhD in organic chemistry and uh, started out that way. Um, so I worked for a lot of spin outs when I finally uh, left academia. Um, a lot of them were solving problems in industry and chemical industry. And um, eventually realised that actually not my passion was around the application of, of technology and science. So it was always at the innovation end of things. I started um, helping a lot of other chemical businesses um, think about innovation in a more deep way. And it ended up almost by accident specialising in sustainability. So I became a real expert on sustainable chemical chemistry approaches. But I got a bit bored listening to a lot of chemists sitting in a room telling each other they had the answer to the world's problems. <laughs> when I got the invite from Innovate UK about 10 years ago to come and work with them to help drive sustainable led innovation across the whole economy, it's too, uh, too good an opportunity to pass up. So I've been doing that for a while now. I've had several different roles within that. For the last four years, it's really been this program here around transforming construction. But the theme has always been innovation. It's always been sustainability-led innovation. Uh, so I've led programs in everything from industrial biology to environmental data um, through resource efficiency, and now um, you know the, the the construction challenge. And I, I think with that, the, the the common problems around innovation and the approaches and the thinking is, is always the same. Uh, and I, I think I found it quite helpful uh, to sit in this challenge here as someone who's a non-expert in the sector um, and can listen very carefully to what people are saying they're trying to do and translate that in a way that makes it accessible for a wider group of innovators to work in. So I think a theme we'll probably come up with quite a bit is cross-sector innovation. Absolutely. And the... The FutureX community is really focused on bringing together that multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary uh, group of thinkers into one space. And it sounds from, from your current role, that's something that you almost deal with on a, on a weekly basis, if not day-to-day -day basis, of, of how do you bring that thinking in from other sectors and other professions. And this, you know, Martin and I and, and our variety of guests up until now have spoke quite a lot about this in terms of the... the the real urgent need for us to look outside of our sector um, at the moment for those solutions and, and actually many of the guests that we've got coming on the show over the coming months are chemists and biologists and marine biologists and microbiologists. So can you talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the sort of breadth of, of people that you're involved with and, and also maybe your views on, on that sort of the need for that multi-sectoral uh, collaboration? 
Well, that's what energises me the most, I think, this, this idea of bringing together people with good different views or different parts of the solution to a problem. That's really where innovation starts to fly. Um, and being in a room in those moments when you realise between you, you've got all the answers to the problem um, is really exciting. And that's really what a lot of what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, with the Transformer Construction Challenge, we're looking here to, to move the sector from... Um, essentially the way it's been producing buildings for decades, you know, almost you know, back to biblical times in a, in a kind of approach, a take on a lot of the, the kind of uh, more modern process industry approaches. And to do that, you want to learn from the best of high value manufacturing. You want to learn from the best uh, in the digital sector. You need to talk to experts in energy um, about where the built environment fits into all of these things. Mm -hmm. And we want, and you know, there's a lot of really amazing ideas out there. So it's, but it's communicating the challenges the sector's trying to overcome in a way that those, um, those experts can see the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's largely been our role is to make it that um, kind of open and understandable by others. Yeah. Um, oh. Including policymakers, of course, because they have a big influence on a lot of this. But yeah, the really exciting thing is to see some of the some of the best stuff that we've supported has come from outside the sector, but they've seen the opportunity to apply it uh, to construction. And I have to say, um, having worked with a lot of different sectors over the years, the construction sector is so quick to adopt really good innovation. If it works, they'll use it tomorrow, and it's almost the point of scaring some manufacturing people. You know, like to take their time and you know really thoroughly test something before it goes. But that's part of that's part of the thing, you build things in the real world. You don't sit and develop a house in a lab, well, not very often. <laughs> so you, you have to kind of apply it in anger uh, to find out if it works. Um, you know, and that's part of the challenge in doing innovation and doing research on buildings. You've got to sell that thing at the end of it. So without the kind of funding we've been able to provide, you can't really try things out. Um, and it's the, yeah, I was going to say, it's the critical role of uh, UKRI and, and the transforming construction sector challenge that it, it enables that entry into the sector. I mean, one of the key things with this, a lot of the startups that we're working with and we're talking to is that they, they have the solutions to the problem in their mind, but they absolutely do not understand the landscape of the construction sector. In, in, in all effects, it's, it's alien to them in terms of the way that it works or, or most of the time doesn't work uh, to facilitate uh, product or innovation coming to market and, and being used in there. So the, the need for, for the role that you guys are playing is, is absolutely critical. What, what do you think is some of, the, um, some of the key characteristics of the businesses that are, that are coming to you, these innovative startups? What do you think some of the key characteristics of those businesses are in terms of the way they look at innovation in comparison to the way maybe the const typical construction sector disciplines look at innovation? I think what we really see is they, they're looking at a problem in a different way. You know, they, they see the same data as everybody else, but what they're looking at when they see this particular challenge is actually that's, it's that kind of problem or it's that kind of problem. And they might look at it in the terms of their sector. So, you know, they might look at um, a process problem and say, well, this is how we would handle it in manufacturing. It's very different to the way construction might have done so. Um, and that's what's really exciting. And I think, uh, a big part of our role, I think, you know, people think, yeah, we're here to give out money, but really we're there to facilitate those those conversations between, as I said, different experts have got a different angle on a problem, but then giving them some money to say, here, you know, spend some time working together, because there's a risk in collaborating in a way that's completely new. That, you know, we'll we'll pay half the costs, go away and work out if this is a go or not. Um, yeah. and the ones that are really are so. Collaboration is huge. That ability and desire to collaborate and look at something different, even within the sector, the best businesses we're working with are saying, you know, we do want to transform the way we work. We are happy to collaborate, potentially even with competitors, to do something differently because we can see the way we're working now um, isn't going to be sustainable in the longer run, and we can understand what our business in the future might look like. Um, and yeah, I think the sector itself has felt that pressure more than ever in the last few years. And that kind of burning platforms being there with the 
the difficulties in, in accessing you know, you're, you're, you know you've got a resource-based model you know, you're, you're very dependent on the, your access to labor and the la you know, access to skilled labor has been decreasing so how do you handle that challenge but, but there's other challenges in the, it's in the sector as well and a lot of these you know the approaches that have been looked at through the transforming construction challenge um you know actually overcome a lot of these different different issues you've touched upon a few different areas around uh, the disruptors that the sector is facing at the moment i mean you clearly we've got the climate emergency we've got issues with supply chain um, and logistics but also resourcing we've got digital disruption um i guess for me and, and i've said it a number of times on on the podcast is that it's a it's an insanely exciting time to be in construction at the moment you know there's so much going on um we've got some great some great guests and some great colleagues joining us on future episodes you know i mean just running through a few of them there's we're looking at um delivering a, affordable housing using mycelium components with some of the some of the, the big players in that scene in in the uk at the moment we're working with guys over in australia who are marine biologists who are using algae and, and small bioreactors to to harvest co2 and vocs from internal air quality and external air to improve that and all of these technologies seem, when you try to talk to uh, the construction industry about them, they seem quite a stretch away, but they're being applied all over the world. And I think one of the things that's really exciting for me is that the pandemic's almost forced the conversation and accelerated the conversation and closed down that geographical distance between ideas. Um, you know, we've, we, we're having such exciting conversations around, well, let's just try and do things a little bit differently. For you, what are the what are some of the really exciting things that you're seeing coming down the line? Well, what I we'd uh, right at the heart of a lot of the transforming construction challenges has been this idea of moving towards a platform approach. So, building buildings more like the way we build vehicles, planes, and cars, and so forth. I mean, as I said, I used to work solving problems in pharmaceutical process stuff. If you made buildings. And if we, so if we used to make if we used to make drugs the way you guys make buildings, it'd be awful. I mean, everything would be different. You know, there's this lack of crossover of learning. That's what's really exciting with the platform stuff. Really, what you're looking to do with taking on all the manufacturing is just automating the dull stuff. And that's yeah. what's. I think now we're going to see some real leap forwards in um, uh, in the efficiency of a lot of businesses, and that's really what. Manufacturing has done very well. It's taken the boring stuff and automated it so that you've got your skilled, smart people focusing on where you can really add value to a building, to the people who use it. The stuff that gets us most excited is where a building's going to make um, you know, the world better for the users of those buildings. You know, working on net zero schools, and knowing for those pupils, not only are they living in a, you know, going to be working in a building that's uh, isn't harming the environment. You get all these knock-on benefits. So you tend to find when you're trying to maximise daylight for energy, you're improving the cognitive uh, situation for those users. And I think this is a big challenge for the sector overall. I think we're going to see these these drivers really whacking the sector hard in the future. But you can make a connection between the physical characteristics of your building and the performance of its users. It's a real issue, and that's that's coming more and more through digital technologies. But yeah, with the automation stuff, we've got to get the process in place first to automate it. Then you can digitise it. Then you've got data you can use to really shape the way you design those things. And then what what comes next is some very very exciting different business models in the way we manage the built environment. And that's the stuff that really lights me up is where we could go potentially with a lot of this. Yeah. And, and Mike, I, I know that you've been visiting some amazing exemplar projects. You know, you, you've been at the, the Barrett Z House. And also you wrote a really interesting article recently where you said that achieving a net zero home is fairly easy. We have the technologies uh, to be able to do it. The challenge or the problem is how do we do it cost effectively? But I know one of the other funded projects, ABC, you know, the Active Building Centre, have, um, have shown this is absolutely possible um, in one of their North Wales projects. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, really, what we're doing when we're, uh, buildings are, are a source, they're a drain on our you know, they're part of the problem with emissions, and they could be part of the solution. That's the really crazy thing. 
you know, why don't we integrate uh, energy technologies at a building level? You know, so it's generating, storing, and managing its own energy better. Um, whether that's for the building occupants or locally within your community or, or you know a wider urban area, and how that interacts with your vehicles and all these other things you know, that are part of the wider system for the world. Um, and that's what the Active Building Centre has been funded to do. How do we bring those technologies, integrate them at a building level, but combine them so they work together? And it's when you combine them, you can often... So, so if you put a heat battery in, you can use a smaller heat pump. If you've got PV in, pulling the heat out of the PV panels and using that elsewhere actually makes the PV perform better. So it's how those things integrate. But you've got all these different retailers selling individual solutions. So it's how they work in integration. That's the, the kind of market failure that the ABC is addressing. And what they've been able to do is start to work with developers to say, if you, you get us in early, and we properly think through a project, um, we can embed this thinking and do it really quite low cost. Mm. What you can't do is design your development and slap this stuff on at the end and think it'll, it'll all work. It's a bit like design thinking. You don't, you don't polish it at the end. You have to be in there from the very beginning. Uh, what they've been able to do with Flintshire County Council is a development in College Key for some social homes where they could only get a lot of funding from the Welsh government if these buildings could be net zero. So they worked with a developer to say that the plot you've got, let's just maximise orientation of these buildings so we get the right kind of solar gain. Let's integrate PV into the roof so you don't have to pay for tiles. Let's get the right combination of stuff. So they've got a blueprint now for how this development can be built um, to build the, you know, these social homes, these new council houses at net zero. Um, and when it looked at the value engineering overall, there is, an, there is obviously an extra cost with these kind of capital pieces of kit, but there's a lot of avoided cost as well. So you don't have to connect them to the gas network because they're off gas. <laughs> so all those prelim works are gone. The prelim works around upgrading the electricity grid in the area to be able to save these extra homes and not because they hardly use it. You know, they are connected to the grid, but it's but not in a lot of massive load all of a sudden. And when you start to look at all those costs together, um, it looks like they're going to at least be the same as the original development design, if not possibly cheaper. <laughs> now, if you get a blueprint like that, and this, of course, that's the cost today, not the cost in the future, because the cost of these technologies are coming down all the time. We could be building brand new homes at net zero for a lower cost than we do now. And then that's, it's insane that we would do anything different. <laughs> You know, what we do with existing housing stock is, a, is a still a challenge, but that's where we're starting to get to. And that's, mm. that's one of the most exciting things to come out of the programme, is that we're, we're on the cusp of this now. We need to go hard at it. Yeah, and absolutely right. You know, cost has always been one of those huge, big stumbling blocks around, you know, sustainability and sustainable, um, you know, design and development. Um, uh, you know, but this is totally ignoring the fact <laughs> that these houses will be cheaper to run. You know, I think that look, we looked at something like it's, you know, the, the original design was something like... Uh, you know, what we would expect now, one and a half thousand pounds mm. a year of energy bills, down to like 84. Yeah. You know, you've got, <laughs> and the, the knock-on benefits, you're less likely, what you find is when um, uh, social homes are retrofitted to good standards is that the tenants start to fall in love with their building because they can afford to heat the whole house, not one room. Yeah. yeah. So their relationship with their area, the home changes, their relationship with the area changes. You know, their... Um, you know, social disruption goes down with massive knock-on benefits to society. Never mind the health costs, avoided health costs. When we look at it in the bigger picture, again, is all these lovely knock-on benefits you can get. And, you know, we could be doing it now. It's just a lack of will. And maybe all the right people in the right room together, working together. And that's what we've tried to facilitate. That's the, yeah. the beauty. And with rising, you know, energy bills, as you mentioned there, it's, it's now is now is the time that we need to be doing this. And I, I know you touched there about, um, especially in the retrofit or the refurb market, you know, what are the barriers? It, it just makes, it's now making economic sense. You know, but what's the barriers to this mass adoption of the technologies that we, that we have available to us? I think a lot of it is cultural. You know, we're quite prepared to spend money in our homes to make a, put a nice kitchen in or a nice mm. bathroom in. Similar kind of costs, you could renovate the outside of your home really quite beautifully. Um, but we've got to work together with the people who are doing those renovations. You know, if you're having windows fitted, that's an opportunity to look at other things. Um, 
you know, if you're having a house when my, you know, my parents had the house rented a little while ago and they didn't get any insulation done before it, but <laughs> wish I'd been there to kind of stop that. You, so you can get your, you know, buildings to look more attractive. But we, you know, we're working now with the finance community to say, look, there's a big knockback benefit for this. The, ha- the value of your house goes up when you, uh, you know, raise it to a higher EPC level. Uh, your your costs come down, so the chance of defaulting on your mortgage go down. There's some real benefits in there. The Green Finance Institute are looking at this. So again, it's having all the right experts in the room. So it's great having technical people saying this is what you can do, but you need the finance people saying, okay, this is what makes sense mm. from a business you know case perspective as well. Um, we work with a lot of people who say, oh, we can do this stuff. But then they're not the ones having to pay for it or think about the uh, how it will be paid for. So that's um, again, that's where you get all the right the right guys together. But yeah, I think a lot of it is is cultural still. We're just not. It has been cheap. Energy has been cheap. Uh, maybe that era has ended now. Um, but there's all these other knock on benefits. You know, if you get off gas, the, it's the pollution side of it as well that people seem to ignore. You know, the main reason I got myself an EV was because I was sick of killing children, you know, through diesel particle emissions, not because I had some great idea that I was reducing my carbon footprint, although that's a bonus. Yeah. Um, we need to do the same kind of thing with the homes. You've got to get gas out of homes yeah. and other buildings. Do you, think you talk about a lot there, Mike, about the, the cultural aspect of that. Do you, do you think there's... Um, a pushback around the, and you mentioned it earlier, around the business models. You know, there's, a, there's there's an awful lot of revolution that's being potentially grown from the ground up with all of this innovation. You know, I I, I would like to see a world where we're not paying for energy at all. You know, I, 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 you talk about it being eighty four pound, but but that's a huge disruption to existing models and the way that people currently think about profit and and and, and those energy pricing models. Um, but it just seems it seems within reach, but there's an awful lot of cultural blockers there in terms it is, of you you've got a lot of sectors realizing in the future they've got to sell services, not stuff. You know, selling gas is not going to be sustainable in the long run. So what you're selling as an energy business is comfort. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what people want to buy. Um, you know, phone companies have been thinking for a long time that at some point they can't keep selling data. You know, people are so used to being connected. What they've got to do is sell a service instead. And you can see them trying to evolve their business model. And you kind of got to take customers with you. Part of the cultural side of it we've looked at quite hard within the challenge is to say, well, when we tell the stories about the challenge, they have to be coherent. They have to work together. Um, what holds back a lot of innovation can be myths. Oh, we've always done it this way. This way won't work. And what you find in your study, any kind of uh, comms and PR work is that you don't, bust myths with facts. What you have to do is tell a better story. You have to replace the existing narrative that's already there. So we've worked quite hard to coordinate and build a bigger narrative about what the future can be like. You know, we, we are stuck in a situation. Uh, there's a system that's evolved through no one's fault in the construction sector where we build the cheapest building, not the one that's got the highest value. And that's the kind of flip we're trying to make here. All, all the work we're doing across the challenge is to help that kind of shift. And who, would, you know, who doesn't want to be part of a sector that's delivering value to society rather than just the cheapest outcome? But this affects all, all kinds of businesses when you're working across innovation. This is what I was saying earlier. A lot of the lessons carry across. A lot of people don't understand how or why their customers are buying their product. So they tend to be end up making money by accident. When you take a more service-based approach, you're thinking much more deeply about what is really uh, being, you know, about the user your customer is really getting from what you're offering. And if you look at all the biggest companies in the world, they all deliver services. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> you, you look at Facebook and Amazon and Apple, that's largely what they're delivering is services, not stuff. And it's in your, your discussion earlier on the platform systems approach is, is almost exactly along those lines in the fact that we, I, I can't help but think, well, first and foremost, that's going to be a, a massive disruptor for some really ingrained players that are already sort of incumbent within the construction sector at the moment because it's it, it's quite a radical shift from the way that they've always delivered buildings uh, to date. 
you know, we saw Google Sidewalk Labs try to dip their toe in in delivering uh, a, a platform system approach over in the US. It was maybe backed up with some slightly dubious data um, grabs and that, that, that were leaked. But nevertheless, that's an external company that has a, a track record for innovation and experimentation looking at our industry and saying, look, guys, what, what, what on earth is going on? This, why, why are there so many moving parts to this? Why is it not easier to deliver this? And just getting frustrated and saying, right, well, we'll just do it ourselves. So it does look like we're moving towards uh, quite a radical shift, particularly with a lot of the new funding that's come through for, uh, from the Crown Commercial Services around MMC providers and, and whatnot in the UK marketplace at the moment. It feels like we're, we're in that transition period at the moment. The government have realised, um, and the UK government did fantastic as part of this challenge in saying, actually, as a customer, we're a big part of this. You know, we buy a third of the UK construction's output. We provide a lot of social infrastructure. We own it and manage it and run it. Where, where that's the case, the business case for this is a lot stronger. Um, so if we're building schools and running them and we have that ongoing cost, it's in our interests to potentially spend a little bit more on capital at the start so that... You know the, the gains in value across it are stronger. You've got it's quite hard to quantify some of those um, other kind of value costs. So running costs, you know, easy to put into a calculator. But you know, what value do you place on um, a child performing better because the cognitive um, experience in that building is better for them? They can stay concentrated longer. They're less distracted. They're healthier because the air they're breathing is clearer. Um, CO2 levels are lower because of you know, you're ventilating the building properly. Uh, the comfort's there, they're not distracted by the fact they're cold or too cold or too hot. And when I was at school, it always seemed to be one or the other. <laughs> um, what value do you place on that? What value do you place on the environmental benefits you've got? Um, you know, some of these are at the macro government level. Yeah. Um, these, they're hard things to get into a, into a business model, but the, the government have kind of understood that this is a challenge. And then when you start to look at how do you get there, so standardising layouts, particularly for buildings like prisons or schools, but they're all roughly the same. You know, when you look at them, a lot of them are done within you know, a, a very small range of dimension controls because a lot of it's legislated. You know, the size of classrooms you know, it tends to be 30 pupils, so you know how big that wants to be. The size of a prison cell is regulated. So standardising, make them all the same. <laughs> You know, get those benefits you get from manufacturing. When you look at some of this and the sheer number of different sizes of doors and windows going into some schools is bonkers. You know, some of the house builders we worked with were saying we've got more bathroom layout design options than we have, you know, house type options. It's bonkers. We don't need that many. Um, and as you start to simplify and standardise, uh, what you're largely doing is the you know, the core structure. You're not saying every building looks the same, but you know most sports halls are pretty much the same dimensions. They're based around football pitch. You standardise it. <laughs> you touched there on on our sort of journey on value, and and we've been quite heavily involved with the construction innovation hubs work on the value toolkit, and 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 that coming through, and it it seems to be. A, to me, that seems to be a real game changer in terms of the UK's position in that we're getting a lot more comfortable with discussing some of those more slightly obscure measures of value. And, and I'll, you know, I'll probably get shot down in comments for, for saying they're slightly obscure because in actual fact, they're not. They're just, we're not used to measuring them. Um, you know, there are metrics available, readily available for uh, social value and biodiversity and increased educational attainment and all the things you talked about there. Um, but we're just not used to and comfortable with having to gather that information and data and knowledge in the construction sector. But it does appear like the tide's starting to turn on that as we get more comfortable with data and data management. Um, we're starting to look at our responsibility around performance measurement and monitoring of the buildings that we create. So, I mean, are you seeing a shift in that space? Yeah, and if the, se yeah, the sector realises it needs more data. Um, but if the sector doesn't do it, it's going to be done to you. This is why, this is what I mean. You know, the, the kind of customers buying these buildings. If you, if you know, if you own, if you're leasing or own 
more likely you're, you're leasing an office block and you know most of your staff are based in the office and you can draw a link between their productivity and the building physics that's really going to start driving you know commercial decisions around, around buildings if you don't do it your customers will and you'll get penalized for it you know very much like the way we might choose our car based on miles per gallon or you know other performance characteristics you know these things are so measurable now and the cost of it is absolutely plummeting it's coming down so fast now we've got to do it ourselves i mean yesterday i was in, in salford looking at the z house again uh, i've been there a few times but they've also got this incredible facility that's you know it's, it's world it's world leading it's the only one in the world it's a huge environmental chamber in the energy house where you know developers can go and build a building and throw any kind of conditions at it you know from i think it's something from something like minus 20 to plus 40 degrees snow you can simulate year-round weather and get very very careful science lab type data on the performance of that building if you don't do it someone else is going to do it for you you know and, and this performance gap problem that we have is going to be forced out into the open you can't just keep building buildings based on input measures people are going to be measuring exactly how they perform in the real world and they're going to come back hard on you if they're not delivering in that way so it's a it's a real challenge not just from environmental performance but as i said from the kind of user performance um, and this is the opportunity for the sector to turn that around and say we can make the world better for people you know we are the way we looked at this uh, before we started the challenge something like you know, half of UK GDP is underpinned by the built environment. The built environment enables a whole load of sectors to perform well. You know, productivity for the whole, you know, half the economy is based on how well our built environment and our infrastructure is performing. Now let's measure that. Let's look at that. Let's build that back into design and do a better job. And uh, you know, exciting things in the UK. I think we've kind of grasped that and we understand that and we're, you know, we're possibly world leading in the way we're applying that certainly or maybe our um, you know public sector and our, you know, the buildings that we pay for as taxpayers um, and we've got to keep that leadership position up we're starting to see that come through in the in things like monitoring the green premium of office space and, uh, and particularly a lot of work that's been done in the us around uh, the impact of air quality and percentage of natural daylight in in those kind of spaces uh, as you say, for schools and workplaces. Um, just just cha changing tack slightly, we've, I mean, we've, we've travelled quite a way in the last 30 minutes from talking about platform system approaches, we've touched on a few other elements. What do you think are the, are the sort of big, chunky things on the horizon for the construction sector with regards to uh, innovation? You know, is it, is it in that biotech space, the digital space? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, uh, you know, the exciting thing when you look at where you can go with the platform stuff is that this is only the beginning of what can happen when you start to you know, standardise your processes and then focus on where you can deliver benefits. Um, I think the really exciting things that a uh, platform approach enables is there's, there's two. The first one is the thinking about the circular economy. Mm. So being able to recover materials you know, when you take a building down not just making them demountable, but when you've got standardised lengths of steel and a steel frame, make them last hundreds of years and keep reusing them. Then, yeah, those kind of possibilities come. And then, you know, you're, you know, you're kind of delivering again to say that um, the, the user benefits of the building and then taking it apart, building another one later on, and delivering those benefits again. And it's, you know, you, you are... <laughs> You've kind of got that kit of parts to go away and rebuild stuff and, and model things um, as society needs you know, different performance and different usages from its, its built environment. So that's some very exciting ideas and thoughts around that. And that becomes, I'd say, much, much easier to do as, a, as an approach. The steel manufacturers are really interested in that. You know, it, it, you know, the ultimate end of this is you put your money in bricks and mortar. Well, you can and the bricks and mortar keep getting reused. Yes. <laughs> that's quite it's, it's, it's a great investment models, and we can we can move towards that. And say, mm. but that that's what happens when you start standardising. You know? yeah. um, expanding your hospital becomes easy because it's based on a standard grid layout. 
um, take repurposing the inside of it becomes easier, uh, but also taking it apart and moving it where it's needed in the future can happen. Um, it's interesting, you, you know, you mentioned that the built environment has this uh, unbelievable impact upon the rest of our economy and the way that our economy performs, which I don't think anybody in the right mind would disagree with. You know, those, they're the spaces in which we function, in which we innovate, in which we enable others to innovate. Um, I think what's really exciting from what you said there about the circular economy is this idea of a future where reuse, there's an acute focus on reuse. And, and actually, you know, you, you say you put your money into steel, but you could look at a future 100 years from now where we don't need much more steel because everybody's reusing that steel and there's such a culture of reuse that's been, that's been born um, through the construction sector. So there's a, there's a really interesting... Um, impact at play there that the construction sector can have not just upon people's lives and and um, national economies but also sort of inter international trade and, and international economies well exactly and you're the experts at taking materials and you know turning them into you know <laughs> infrastructure make it easy to take it apart again and, and then kind of rebuild it and you're still selling the same thing but you're not having you're not having to go and get new new resources the resource crunch we're seeing now which hopefully might start to drive some of that in the longer run i mean this is this is long this is more long longer sighted stuff but the opportunity becomes much clearer as to how you would get there uh, on the journey that we're kind of on we will deal with embodied carbon that is getting sorted you know the, elsewhere within innovate uk we're funding uh, work to tackle some of this so you know using hydrogen to make um glass you know, arc furnaces for steel, um, closing the loop on recycling and getting the quality up there. You know, that, that kind of stuff is being funded. We will we will crack those things. I'm very convinced of it. Um, but that doesn't mean you don't want to reuse this idea of reusing environments. I think the other opportunity platforms brings is to start to flip away from speculative build to building to design. You know, you're bringing down how fast you can deliver a building. It designs almost a push of a button, certainly for the bulk of it. If those components are available out in an open marketplace and the build's that much faster because of the way you standardize your processes, you can very quickly build buildings um, you know, to the, the demands of the owners and users. And that's the kind of flip that can start mm. to come. In a digital world, you can very quickly design and look at your building and you know, who doesn't want to buy a home that's really based around them. That's kind of not being offered now. Uh, it, it is in some other countries, but that's certainly something I think um, in, the, in the longer future that I think we'll see more of that kind of thing. I agree, Mike. I think, you know, we're seeing that, that sort of treatment as buildings as material banks, you know, it's changing the way that I think people are starting to invest in buildings. We're seeing adaptive homes or homes for life where your your homes and your layout can change over the period of time that, that you're in that. I think what's really interesting to me, and I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball at um, Oliver here, is that what we're talking about there is a, you know, is a, is a fundamental change in the way that we design our buildings. So, Oliver, does the role of an architect change? You know, we're talking a lot about standardising components, standardising, you know, and, and are we taking out the design or is the role that design I, plays changing? Yeah, so I, this is something I was leading to with Mike in some of the earlier questions, is that I, you know, I... I can't help but see a sort of mass extinction of construction sector professionals on the horizon for the people that don't <laughs> want to get on board. You know, if you if you are if you are obsessed with doing things the way that you've always done things, if that is the bit that you've got between your teeth, oh, we've ridden loads of ups and downs. It's going to be fine. We'll mm. we'll keep specking what we've spec because we're making a whacking great profit. Um, and those issues around value and understanding value in the supply chain. For me, it's, it's the companies and the people who are really getting to grips with the potential and the opportunity that uh, innovation within industry offers. You know, we're, we're definitely, in my opinion, on the crest of a wave here um, around the, a new potential, a new potential around how we think about energy, as, as Mike's talked about, and a, an entirely new potential around how we think around design and reuse and disassembly and, mm. and the reuse of waste and how we how we sell plots of land, how we sell buildings. Um, and all of that, as, as Mike so eloquently put it, is focused on the user. It's focused on improving people's lives. 
um, and, and the occupant of those buildings. So, so in, in my opinion, yes, I think it's fundamentally going to change um, the face of architecture. But I think architecture has been slowly changing, maybe begrudgingly, over the last sort of 15 years. But, but it's quite like getting closer to the user, isn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. See, so, yeah, when, you, when you're taking more of a build by design, or, as I said before, you'll be forced to. You'll be forced to, be forced to focus on the user, um, either you know, by the user or by disruptors who will do that for you and offer something superior. You can't just build it and say, oh, that's how it is now, it's your problem. Absolutely. You know, yeah, we I, build I, as cheaply as we can. Now, you know, <laughs> you know operating it is your issue. Yeah. And I think I think it makes it more exciting. So the you know I often often quote Jeremy Till here because he, he he lambasted architecture and the heroic genius of the architect and and I, I, I'm totally on his side with that. You know, if you're a business like we are that is just entirely focused on improving people's lives and doing it in a really efficient way, I I don't think there's anything to worry about with with the, the future direction. You know, it's well, what are the big innovations? How can we make this better? What value can we add that's going to strengthen that community or or make the air quality better, um, or deliver this building faster because there's so many other um, important aspects to get right on on a, on a wider site or estate. So the, it doesn't worry me in, in that sense. And, I, and actually, I'm much more comforted by the fact that we're moving away from this idea of, of, of one individual's heroic idea of the way the world should work towards, towards an entirely sort of democratic collaborative, community-focused, co-created world where we're working really hand-in-hand in hand with communities and, and, and craft, trying to help them craft a bespoke um, existence, you know, with, it, with, with the way that they use energy, with the way that they travel, with the way that they use different vehicles or maybe want more uh, green infrastructure in their, in their environments. So it's, it's insanely exciting, the opportunities for me in terms of architecture, because it adds a lot more constraints, but a lot more opportunities to do things a slightly different way. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, it's the whole health wellbeing agenda at the moment. I think people want and communities that they can live in they want the green space but also in terms of our homes we want better acoustically sound homes we want um you know more use of natural building materials and and you know mike you made this comment at the start that we've had the same technologies for decades but actually i see some of the best innovation now coming out of our natural building products our increased use of um timber of you know hempcrete of um, you know that biophilic design movement as well. It's a fascinating place. I, I don't think innovation always has to be something new, shiny, and technology driven. It can just be a better way of using technology we already exists. It's, it's very tangible, very six, all five senses kind of thing. Um, the first time I ever went into you know, a really high performing, um, you know, highly insulated building, and kind of it was on a windswept moor in Dundee actually, and I, <laughs> I closed the door and. <laughs> Silence, comfort everywhere. No hot spots, no cold spots. You're like, oh my god! You know, it, it's, it's almost visceral the way you interact with a building like that. More people need to experience what a really great building actually feels like. That's the thing. We sell things like insulation and all these benefits on um, on things like, oh, it'll save you money, uh, it'll save the environment. But who doesn't want a quieter home? Who doesn't want a home where the air quality is better, so you sleep better? You know, who doesn't want a home that you know stays in the same kind of comfort levels all the time? You know, it, it, these are things that people can really engage with. We don't sell it in those ways because probably from a lack of imagination. And that's the big opportunity for architecture and design and the whole sector to say, this is what we're selling you. And this, we're going to give you this in a better way. You know, we're not just, it's not just a, a brick box we're, we're flogging you. We're giving you these kinds of experiences and maximizing them for you. And that's the future for the sector. I think you said it, I think you said it best, Mike, when you said that it's not about, it's not about killing people with facts and figures. It's about fundamentally rewriting the narrative and changing the story of the kind of future that, that we could we could live in. I guess that's a, it's a good point and a good part for us to sort of wrap um, on today's chat with you. But, but but to put you the question that we put everybody in terms of what do you think, you know, what's your vision of the future that you'd really like to see the, 
the, the built environment to contribute to creating. I, I, I really think there's an opportunity here for uh, the built environment sector to be the, you know, to really set the agenda around net zero. It could move so quickly to be, you know, this is one of the areas that hasn't moved and transport's getting its, its, uh, its shift and energy's starting to bring its uh, emissions down. So it hasn't really done that yet, and it, but it could be the absolute exemplar. But going beyond that, as I said, to giving a better life to the users of buildings, you've got to be user focused. Um, you know, I'd like to be able to buy or rent, you know, a building that has all of those things I just talked about. <laughs> you know, zero energy bills would be nice. Being paid even for your building contributing to a net zero energy system. You know, the built environment can solve all these other problems. You know, people say, where are you going to get all the energy from to charge all these electric vehicles? Well, where are you going to put all that energy you're generating on buildings if you build them properly? You know, the, 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 the built environment is the answer to nearly every other challenge around net zero, and it needs to really jump and look at that. And I'd be very excited to be part of that, hopefully. Great, great response, Mike. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, mate. Well, thank you both. Really, thank you. really enjoyed it. Wow, so many topics talked about, so many sort of issues and you know solutions actually to, to the many barriers we have about getting innovation into the built environment. Oliver, what were your key takeaways from, from that discussion? Oh, well, aside from being outrageously inspired, Mon, um, I think the next thing for me to take away from this conversation with Mike, and it, it, what really, really rang true is, you know, we absolutely need performance measurement and monitoring you know we absolutely need those metrics um we're, we're getting much better with how we manage data on projects and it's a fundamental part of monitoring and measuring performance but we're never going to change culture and change you know change hearts and minds with data and figures um for me what rang true and what really hit home with mike was the need to fundamentally shift our narrative to tell a different story um, about how buildings can really affect our lives, how the environments that we create can create stronger communities, can uh, improve educational attainment and can improve the air quality and, and our general life experience. So for me, the takeaway was to tell a better story. Oh, I agree. I agree. And I, and I think, you know, when he talked about you need to experience innovation, you need to experience a well-insulated, acoustically sound home to really get you know, the value that that can add to all of our lives. It, it was, yeah, a very inspiring um, conversation. If you like that, well, we've got a real treat for you coming up in the next few episodes because that was the first of our almost innovation series of talks. Oliver, can you tell us a little bit or give us a sneak peek about some of the guests we've got coming up and some of the innovations we're going to be exploring? Yeah, we've got some great, great guests coming up on the, on the pod. We've got... Um, some people I've worked really reasonably closely with in the last 12 months. So we've got a great company called Spera, who are de de developing carbon negative block work, um, but also with one eye on how they support the sustainable circular economy. You know, we've got the guys from Thermulon who are doing a very similar thing, but with creating um, fire safe insulation. So there's, there's a plethora of, of really innovative uh, guests lined up in the run up to future book. And I've just, I just implore people to subscribe and share and, and make sure they're joining us to, to hear some of the great things that these guys are going to be talking about. Brilliant. Um, and also, if you like the podcast, please share and subscribe. Join our community to stay up to date with all things FutureX. Visit futurebuild.co.uk to sign up. Please also like them and share them to help grow our community. You can subscribe to the podcasts within your favourite podcast platform. Thanks so much for listening and we hope you'll be back again soon.